All right, so here we are back again, uh, talking about the book of Acts, chapters two and four. Doreen and I have been talking for the past couple videos about those chapters, different uh, angles, uh, perspectives, how we might think about them, uh, what they mean for us today. And today I'm joined by Timothy Keiterling, who's a fellow Bruderhof member here at Woodcrest. And we're gonna continue the conversation a bit, maybe in a bit of a different vein. Timothy's been studying theology for the past six years, uh, first at Nyack College in Nyack, New York, and then at Princeton Seminary in Princeton, New Jersey. Is that right? Yep. And what's your next step, actually? This is kind of exciting. Yeah, so this fall I'm beginning a PhD program at the Hebrew University in the Department of Comparative Religions. I'll be studying the first three centuries of Christianity. Very exciting. Right where it all happened. Yeah. And uh, what we're going to try to cover today um, are maybe getting some get into some weeds that we weren't able to uh, in our previous videos. But first, I'm kind of interested, what made you want to start studying theology in the first place? That's a really good question. So I had been, as most people here are, quite familiar with the stories of the Bible, you know, the, the well-known figures of the Bible throughout my childhood and growing up, but at the Mount Academy, I had the chance to take a class on the Bible with Charles Moore, who's another Bruderhof member who you may have seen on our YouTube channel. And for whatever reason, he inspired me to dig deeper, uh, to find out more. That was just the beginning though. Then a couple of years after I graduated from the Mount, I had been doing this and that working in the publishing house and working at the factory, but then I was invited to come back to the Mount for a internship working alongside Charles. And at the end of this one year internship, a couple of people sat down with me and said, this would be a really, really good thing for you to pursue because you obviously love it. And I did, I, I really did. So I enrolled in Nyack College and continued my studies. Now for um, viewers, you might not be familiar with this, but um, we actually don't tend to talk a lot about theology here on the Bruderhof. In fact, there's, there may even be a certain amount of animus uh, to the subject. So I'm interested, TJ, why do you think that is, and would you like to see that change? Good question. So the best explanation I could probably give is that because of our roots in the Anabaptist tradition, we're very, we're very focused on practice. We, we like to get involved with not just talking about our faith or thinking about it, but living it out. And I think that's important, and I think that should stay that way. The one thing that I would kind of like to see going forward is that somehow, whether it be through just learning how to speak about these things better, or maybe sending more people to study what I studied, um, that we can at least learn to interact with people, you know, from other backgrounds who are also Christians, uh, using some of this language. Uh, the, the academic study of theology or of biblical studies can help us find common ground with other Christian groups. And I think that that would be healthy and that would be wise going forward. Do you, do you think there are any dangers or pitfalls and what might those be? Oh yeah. So especially especially during my last year at Princeton in a couple of different classes, I got to see pretty much every bad stereotype about academia and about academic theology lived out. Uh, it's, I was studying with great people and, and they, they reached out to me and they connected with me, but unfortunately, the academic study of theology can involve a lot of arrogance, a lot of, um, you know, people being stuck in their heads for whatever reason, uh, writing books about ideas that have really important real world application, but paying absolutely no attention to the real world. For instance, I came across a book by some colleagues of some faculty at Princeton that came out in the last year where they were basically arguing that Acts 2 and 4 was supposed to be some kind of version of the Golden Age myth. In other words, it never really happened. It, the, the author of the book of Acts kind of wove it in there just to show that this was how the church began and it was, 
you know, the same kinds of beginnings as other iterations of the Golden Age myth. Anyway, it's that kind of thing where you, you have this you have this idea and you think, oh, that's cool, but then you don't really think, what does this mean for people who are trying to live out their faith? Well, that's interesting you, mean, you bring that up because in one of our videos, Doreen and I were actually talking about X2 and 4 being the realization of those, um, those ancient ideals um, uh, from antiquity. Anyway, just to get to, um, to our subject matter for this sure. series, um, Doreen and I have been focusing specifically on the parts of X2 and 4 uh, that talk about community, and we've been sort of unap unapologetically advocating life and community modeled on the description of the early church. But I'm interested, what are the best arguments? You mentioned some poor arguments, but what are the best arguments you've heard against our position, and then how would you respond to them? So the people who would say that Acts 2 and 4 was just, you know, one phase in the development of Christianity, the, the communal living was a passing phase, uh, they argue that we can't treat the book of Acts as prescriptive. In other words, we can't look at what they did and say we have to imitate that at every step of the way because for whatever reason they experienced a lot of things that we simply haven't been experiencing. Um, you know, a vibrant culture of healing, of miracles, of the activity of the Holy Spirit. and. The, these people would argue that, in many ways, the book of Acts belongs to what they call the apostolic age, where the Holy Spirit was especially active, the gift of apostleship was still alive, and <clears throat> they would just say, that was then, this is now, now it's different. The Holy Spirit is still active, of course God can still work, but the same rules don't really apply. And I can see how I can, I can totally see how that, how that would be persuasive because in many ways it's true. We don't really have apostles anymore like they did back then. But yet I would still kind of push back a little bit against arguments like that. What would you say? I would say that the life and community described in the book of Acts is a perfectly logical next step after hearing what Jesus said during the three years of his ministry. Um, if we're going to take everything that Jesus said and actually apply it in a day-to-day -day life together, first of all, it's going to be together. It's going to be the kind of life where money and possessions, if they're not totally renounced, they're at least going to take second place or third place or be put on the back burner. It's going to be the kind of life where we hold to the witness of peace. Uh, you know, some of these big ideas that motivate what we do here at the Bruderhof, um, they don't just belong in Acts 2 and 4. They, they're all through the Gospels. I've always understood Acts 2 and 4 as these people knew about Jesus. Many of them had heard Jesus speak. They had listened to him. They had followed him. And in their minds, a life like this was just the next right thing to do. It wasn't something crazy or outlandish. It just, it made sense. I don't know if that makes sense yeah. to you. No, that's, yeah. that's good. Um, following on to that, some Christians and some evangelicals in particular say that living in community ignores uh, Christ's command to go make disciples of all nations. And some years ago, Alan Kreider made minor waves with his book, The Patient Ferment of the Early Church, arguing that the early church didn't grow because of powerful missionary preaching and conversions, but because its worship and way of life was attractive to outsiders. And Gerhard Lofink, who you, um, I think you spent a year mm -hmm. with? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, five months, yeah. Or five months with? Yeah. In his Jesus and Community, which if you haven't read that, you really should read uh, Jesus and Community. He also seems to assert that the way the early Christians lived together and cared for one another was was their missional activity. That was mission for them, living together. Uh, where do you land? That's a really good point. So you kind of, I guess you kind of have to take both at once because that kind of life that they were living was really inviting, really welcoming, a really persuasive picture of what it looks, what it looks like um, to follow Jesus. Uh, a couple of things. Back then, you did have a very living culture of 
of speaking, of arguing, of debating, like this famous scene in Act 17, where Paul goes to the Areopagus in Athens. Uh, this was a normal place for people to get, to get together and argue. It was like, you know, uh, these days going to the bar and having an argument or something. Um, so you had a very living culture of just lots of discussion and talk. And it would have been really persuasive to see that here's this community that didn't just have persuasive teachers, people who could talk a lot, but they actually lived it. So I can totally see how this kind of um, thinking, you know, to say the life together was what persuaded them. Uh, in a way, it does make sense, but yet I would push back a little bit and say that from the very beginning, the passing on of Christian faith has always been about teaching. And this, this somehow has to take place. The, the teaching people to obey what Jesus said, right? It's the Great Commission. But you have within Christianity a very living culture of, of you know, discussion, of asking questions and answering them, of, of exploring everything that has to do with the faith. And this would have been, at least in my understanding, this would have been what they were doing. They weren't just planting churches and living in community, but they were talking to people. They were telling people about what they were doing. Um, so, to make a long story short, I think it's both. I think it's the life, and I think it's the, the spreading the gospel, the teaching and preaching. And to be clear, you know, the Bruderhof is, you know, we are a missional church. We do send people out. Um, and, but also a very important part of our mission is to our, our own young people, I mean, to our own right. households. So that's, right. that's also, an ex you know, we see example of that um, in the early church, that, you know, the passing on of the faith to one's children was actually a primary, uh, one of the primary ways the church grew. Right, right. I mean, it goes back to uh, the book of Deuteronomy and the, the thinking within Judaism that as a parent or as an adult, your first responsibility is to pass on your faith to your children. It's in this famous prayer that, that Jews say, the Shema, hear Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and so on, and it talks about <clears throat> You are supposed to meditate on these things when you get up and when you lie down, and you're supposed to write them on your doorposts and on your gates, and you're supposed to talk about them with your children. So this kind of thinking within Judaism grew into this culture of, as you're saying, passing on the faith to the next generation within Christianity. So you're writing your thesis on Acts, something you don't know. So I am writing, this is a good question. I actually just had my first meeting with my advisors yesterday, where we, we spent about an hour talking about this. And this is what we came to. Um, I'll try to summarize it shortly. I'm writing about Paul the Apostle's method of reading the Hebrew Bible as a source for what, he, what they would have called halakha, which is advice about practice, about daily life. Um, in comparison with the way that other New Testament writers read the Hebrew Bible, and then in comparison with the way that the early rabbis and the people at Qumran read the Hebrew Bible. Because what you have is you have three or four different groups, possibly more, who all considered themselves Jews, including Paul and his, and his followers. They all drew from the Hebrew Bible as a source of wisdom for daily life, but they came to some really, really interesting different conclusions about what different things meant. So I'm going to be exploring that. Um, and what I'd, like, the, what I'd really like to see is whether or not we can use this as a little window into who Paul was, what his background was, um, and then as another little window into how Christians kind of became their own entity separate from Judaism over time. Well, that should be very interesting. We look yeah. forward to uh, hopefully reading it one day and it'd be even cooler if we could do another video once you get to Jerusalem and... Oh, that would be fantastic. <laughs> so we'll see what happens with that. Anyway, uh, I think that's all 
for this video. Thanks for watching. Um, make sure to watch the other videos in this series. And if you haven't, please subscribe to our channel for just more awesome content like this.